Hey folks, before we get started, I'm going to call to your attention a guy right here. His name is Joseph Tyner, and he does an amazing job for the forum as our sound guy. And he's just stepped up to the plate the entire forum season to haul gear through rain, sleet, and snow. Uh, listen to my quirky, subjective orders on where to lay cable, and he's just does do, just an amazing job. And I want to say thank you. Um, thank you, Joseph. Thank you. Thank you. Tyner, you're on. Ladies and gentlemen, the uh, Washington County Public Affairs Forum a noon meeting is beginning. This is um, Monday, June 20th. Um, the Public Affairs Forum, despite certain inertia, aims to get issues out to the public, whether the public wants to see them or not. And we think there's important things out there. And um, we have a cable TV service that we provide. We have a streaming video. We have a video online. We've got the Facebook. But again, the members of Public Affairs Forum are trying to, to get issues out. And one of the most important issues out there is um, water and how we use water. And we've got um, Diane Kanaguchi Dennis, the Deputy General Manager of Clean Water Services, that's going to talk about the Fern Hill wetlands. Several of the wetlands, uh, uh, Jackson, uh, the Jackson Slough area, the Fern Hill wetlands are very, very cutting edge. Uh, uh, improvements in what's existed in the past. In Washington County, Clean Water Services is leading the country in some of this technology. So I would like to invite her up here, and I usually have people introduce themselves just because in the past people have claimed um, inventions such as, you know, the automobile and um, things of that nature. And after having read those for several years, I've decided to let people tell other people what they think is important about their lives. And, so, Diane, would you come up and tell us about the wonderful services the agency is providing? And you can introduce yourself also. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here to um, address the Washington County Public Affairs Forum and to share with you the exciting things that are happening at the Fernhill Wetlands that's located on Fernhill Road next to our Forest Grove Clean Water Facility. I'm Diane Taniguchi dennis and it's a pleasure to serve all of you in Washington County as the Deputy General Manager for Clean Water Services. I joined the district pretty recently in um, August of 2011, and it's really a uh, wonderful um, place to be able to provide my public service. But before we begin discussing our Fernhill Wetlands Improvement and Water Reuse Project, I wanted us all to take a moment to ponder about how we as individuals value water in our daily lives as we work, as we live, and as we play here in Washington County. Water is often perceived simply as a substance, as H2O, the universal solvent that's used to create the goods and the buildings of our progress to quench our thirst, to grow our food, to water our lawns, to fight our fires, and to wash our wastes away. It's a substance that we use and dispose of down the drain. As Oregonians, we place great value in the natural beauty of the Pacific Northwest with our clean air, our clean water, and the myriad of local foods that we can choose from. Yet in our recent surveys here in Washington County, we find that even though we place a very high value on our water resources, our citizens do not feel a very close personal connection to the river in their daily lives. And this is something that concerns us as we move into the future uh, generation of the provision of water in Washington County. At the root of our social and cultural perception of water, is that most of us live in urban areas where water flows by, often unappreciated in culverts and ditches. We have clean water delivered to our homes and our businesses by a simple turn of a tap. The technology that we use to deliver clean water is hidden. It's underground, it's behind closed doors, and behind security fences. Our society has become increasingly insulated and blind to the inherent beauty and wonder in the ecosystem 
and the technology that creates clean water. On a global scale, water is the common trust for all of humanity. Water knows not of geopolitical boundaries. Water is essential for all life, whether human, animal, or plants. All water on this earth is used and reused. Our hydrologic cycle is powered by the sun and its elegance. Water that evaporates into the atmosphere quickly falls back to us as precipitation. The average time that water spends in our atmosphere is just nine days. The time water spends in our lakes and our rivers where we can most influence it is generally considered to have a time with us of weeks to months. By contrast, once water reaches the ocean, it can stay there for a very, very long time on this earth. The average time it stays in the ocean is often more than 3,000 years, which is very interesting. Because when we begin to think about where water is on the Earth, we find that 97.5% of the Earth's water, of 1.386 billion cubic kilometers of water, is saline in our oceans, with only 2.5% available as fresh water. And of that fresh water that's available, approximately, oh, almost 70% is stored frozen in our ice caps, in our glaciers, in our permafrost, with 30% in our groundwater. And only 0.4%, you look at the beaker, it's that little strip of red is really in our surface water or um, our atmospheric water. So when you look at it from another view of a, a series of these little red squares, of the 0.4% of surface water and atmospheric water, approximately only 67.4% is in lakes, 8.5% of that's in wetlands, and 1.6% is in rivers, with the rest in plants and animals and humans and soil moisture in the atmosphere. So when you think about it, the Tualatin River, its tributary streams, and places like Fern Hill are part of that precious 0.4%. We're truly blessed to have the river here in Washington County. So some of you may remember some of the history of clean water services that we first started as the Unified Storage Agency in 1970. And some of you may have remembered the history where we were created by the vote of the people. And it was created to solve the water pollution issues that were plaguing the Tualatin River. As the Washington County and the communities grew, there were 26 separate wastewater treatment facilities that operated at varying degrees of water quality performance, and that caused the state of Oregon to issue a building moratorium in the county. In 2006, we rebranded our name to Clean Water Services, and it's more reflective of our vision to enhance the environment and quality of life in the Tualatin River watershed through visionary and collaborative management of our water resources in partnership with others. Today, Clean Water Services is a county service district that serves a population of more than 525,000 in cooperation with 12 cities. We have four regional treatment facilities. So we went from 26 down to four. And these four facilities are located here on this drawing. Um, our Durham treatment facility, our Rock Creek Treatment Facility, our Hillsboro uh, Treatment Facility, and our Forest Grove Facility. And combined, these facilities treat over 60 million gallons of sewage per day. That's a lot of sewage that comes from this county. To some of the highest quality of water in the nation. Our Rock Creek, so this treatment facility here, and our Durham facility here, operates all year round, whereas currently, our Forest Grove facility and our Hillsboro facility only operates during the winter time. And all of the flow from Forest Grove and Hillsboro it, during the summertime is uh, transported through two 24-inch uh, lines to the Rock Creek treatment facility. So the Fern Hill project is a keystone and it's a game changer project for the district. And the reason is that it will allow us to utilize all year round both the Forest Grove and the Hillsboro facility by providing the additional treatment that's necessary so that we can operate these facilities during the summer months. 
It will also offload the Rock Creek facility from having to treat the water from Forest Grove and Hillsborough during the summer so we can preserve that very important capacity as we grow industrial um, in the North Hillsborough area. It's a very important um, ability to utilize the assets that we have already invested in um, to their fullest potential. So let's take a look at the area where the Fernhill project is located off of Fernhill Road. The white line on this drawing is the boundary of land that's owned by Clean Water Services. It's 748 acres. Back in 1940, a wastewater treatment facility was built, it's right in that corner there, for the city of Forest Grove. And then later in 1964, its capacity was expanded by adding these um, sewage lagoons here. And then in 1992, the Fernhill Wetlands Management Council was formed with both the Fernhill Wetlands Council and the Friends of Fernhill Wetlands because over time, these ponds, rather than being used as sewage ponds, they became really ponds that the uh, migratory birds were using as a natural area. In 2006, Clean Water Services purchased the land and the forest grove treatment plant. And in 2008, we began a master plan as the beginning for the vision of the Fernhill Wetlands and this whole surrounding area. The treatment plant was um, recently upgraded in 2011 to a full secondary treatment plant. And the concept of the natural treatment <coughs> system was developed in, starting in 2010. So there's a lot of history here with the Fernhill wetlands themselves, as well as the history with how we can best utilize our assets to create a cost-effective wastewater treatment system for our county. Um, the starts of um, some new energy that's being put out there, right at the entrance here, there's a brand new picnic shelter and restroom. And in 2012, Clean Water Services constructed the very first phase of the treatment wetlands that includes a water feature and some bridges to allow for pedestrian access. There is a significant number of partners that are part of um, this project, and it's a project that will take place between now and 2017. So our project goals. This is a lovely picture of um, Fernhill Lake, and what we want to do is provide cost-effective water quality improvements so we can be attentive to our ratepayers to create um, rates that are um, something that we can all be willing and, and able to, to support, to um, advance wastewater treatment sciences for natural treatment systems. Because the reality is these wastewater treatment plants can remove 99% of the pollutants. And what's remaining are those things that the plants and the animals and the system needs to be able to transform into food and into growth. And so that's the purpose of the natural treatment systems, to create a higher ecological value of the water before the water is returned to the river itself. We're going to be enhancing habitat and the wetland function, as well as providing a space for education and recreation. It's somewhat hard to believe that you can go to a wastewater treatment plant for recreation and education. And, um, and through this beautiful space, we'll be able to um, enhance that out there. This is an overview of the project site. And the current um, focus is in the wetlands themselves. So in the next, um, between now and 2015, our primary work will be in this area here. But um, in future years, we'll be taking a look at enhancing this agricultural area and the mitigation wetland zone, as well as the agricultural areas here to the west. So it all starts with the Forest Grove uh, Clean Water Facility. And as I said, it, it transforms 98% of the carbon, the nitrogen, and the phosphorus into biosolids that can be reused as soil amendments and agricultural lands, and it also produces clean water. The natural treatment system will further cool the water and transform the remaining carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus into plants and food for the wildlife. This next picture is a, a cutaway of the where Forest Grove uh, 
clean water facility is, and the water will be pumped from the treatment facility up to the top here, and the water from Hillsborough will also come in a pipeline to this point. It would then go through the upper treatment wetlands, down through here, there would be a lower set of treatment wetlands, and they will, both the top and the bottom will come together in the mixing wetland. It stopped working, so we'll, we'll put that aside. It's a little bit of a technology failure here. But there's a uh, mixing wetland where that number one is, and then um, that was the very first project that we constructed, and then it went through a series of um, aeration steps through waterfalls, and then down into Ferndale Lake itself. And then the next phase, this is a, a shot a little further away, where we're going to be focusing on um, the Ferndale Lake, the Eagle Perch Marsh and Cattail Marsh to be able to have them function better. And then the water at first will um, go back into a pipe, back to the Tualatin River. In later years, we'll be able to use the water as irrigation water for the agricultural land on the east and ultimately on the west. We have to build berms to be able to uh, uh, create treatment wetlands. And as part of that, it's for maintenance. So if we're going to build berms for the treatment wetlands themselves and for maintenance, we might as well make those available to the public so that you can create a public space where um, citizens can come and they can um, uh, view birds and they can uh, recreate and to um, be able to get outside and enjoy sunny days like we have here today here in Oregon. So in terms of the project timeline, um, we started planting, if any of you have been out there recently, um, with some native plant restoration, um, the restroom and the public picnic shelter was built, and we built our first three acre treatment wetland and um, the water garden. In 2013, you'll start seeing some work on the upper treatment wetlands and some lower pond enhancements, and through 2014 and 15, it's when we'll complete the upper treatment wetlands. That's a, that was a quick gathering um, of folks on July 31st of 2012, where we dedicated the picnic shelter and restroom. And the restrooms were extremely important. In fact, it competed well for a grant um, through the State Parks Department, because people came out to this wonderful space, but there really was no facilities to um, have used. So it was a partnership between the City of Forest Grove, the Fern Hills Wetland Council, Clean Water Services, and the Oregon Department of Parks and Recs to be able to create this facility. And it's also an important um, stop as part of the um, Oregon bikeway that is going to be created in the future. Before um, we constructed the very first phases of that first wetland um, and reconfigured the shore at Fern Hill Lake, this is what it looked like. So essentially a big asphalt pad and um, um, some facilities that our field operations folks use. So if you can kind of keep this picture in mind, um, then this is what we created. So this is a, a pretty quick snapshot of the new treatment wetlands and um, the reiteration of waterfalls that were created. And um, this is the location at the very edge of the waterfalls there where we'll meet water quality requirements so that it'll enable us to use the water for irrigation and other, other things. So this is what it looked like, an asphalt storage pad in May of 2012. Um, and um, this is what it began transforming um, this next few months. Um, this is um, a crew um, from Carisu International. They began hand placing the boulders for a water feature. So what looks like a beautiful waterfall actually has a treatment function. And that function is to create oxygen in the water, which is needed um, to sustain the water as it goes into the uh, to nature itself. So it's a requirement that we have, but instead of using large uh, blowers and diffusers and mechanical systems, we were able to accomplish the same thing using gravity and, and rocks in a very beautiful way. So there's a thousand tons of boulders that came from a local tiger quarry that went into um, building this feature out there. So that's one of the results uh, with the very first flow uh, putting over the, the waterfalls as, as we're testing the hydraulics. So it's a, a beautiful place to be able to um, 
come and enjoy the environments as well as uh, a place where we can learn about water and also reuse water. Um, it's interesting, we're just in the very early phases of construction and we have folks like on um, Grant's Getaways, on KGW's uh, TV channel, they, they already came to, to feature what's going on at Fernhill and there's a lot of excitement. It's generated hundreds of people coming to visit the area. It's generated um, folks being interested in um, ecotourism um, in the area. There was a Fernhill Ale that was um, brewed uh, just for this particular um, uh, project and uh, folks are enjoying coming to the site. Um, there's a coffee I hear that's now being roasted. But there's just a lot of excitement about um, being involved in this area and, and being able to link both ecotourism and business and um, community um, support. So this is a group of folks that came for the Birds in Beer. Uh, that was on October 6, 2012. And I hear there's another event being planned that's going to be Birds, Beer, and Wine, I hear, um, this year. But it's a collaboration with the Intertwine Alliance, uh, Portland Audubon, McMinniman's Grand Lodge, who brewed the beer, and the Fernhill uh, Wetlands Council. It was a great event to uh, celebrate. Um, children are um, coming to the site, and they always have, but they're very interested in um, augmenting the science learning about biology and chemistry and also the physics of, of water. And there's uh, many children. These are um, second graders from the Forest Grove Community School that came um, this past fall. There's um, school groups coming to plant. There's community groups coming to uh, work on the landscaping. There's photographers that come to the site to um, take pictures of the very interesting um, species that are there. And that bottom uh, picture of a shorebird, it was an exciting event. The shorebirds hadn't been to the site in many, many years. And all we did was lower the elevation of the water in the big lake. And for some unexplainable reason, they all knew that there was shoreline and mud created. And, and these birds came from afar to uh, visit the site. Um, just another shot that uh, Gary uh, Wilts has taken in the front of the Dallas. Just a very beautiful space. Um, I invite all of you to come and enjoy it um, right here in our Washington County. Thank you.
our hope is that there will be people that will come here to uh, study and to uh, watch the birds, as well as people that will come here to learn about water itself, and others that will just come to enjoy the, the trails that um, will be created out there. But yes, security, and, and I think that's incumbent upon all of us to uh, maintain that. Four member questions on an off topic just because it was an Multnomah County election tomorrow. It's assumed that most Washington County water is fluoridated, and that decision was made back in the 20th century, and there was no public complaint about it, so there was no public vote about it. Is that correct? You know, fluoride here um, in Washington County and in the Portland area is an, an issue that I have personally been involved in, so I can't really comment about the history of fluoride. Other than in the other communities that I worked in, in Salem and both Albany as their public works director, um, fluoride was very important to the communities. It was put in place by the vote of the people. But that's not to say that there aren't folks that are very concerned about fluoride and there are concerns about adding additional chemicals into the water source. So it's really a public choice. It's a public decision as to how do we as citizens and as society want to deal with, deal with the issues of children's teeth and, and health, but it's often a very personal decision and often a very controversial decision. But is your most Washington County water is for you? Um, I don't really know. That's, okay. yeah. Much of the water comes from uh, some of it from the Bull Run, so from Bull Run it certainly isn't, but I don't know about um, the other water facilities. Hi, I'm Phil Nelson, Farm Member. I've been reading about uh, shortages of water nationwide problems with drawing down an aquifer that apparently has about 10,000 years old in it. I was wondering what planning if any uh, Clean Water Services has done long-term projections in regard to water supply and changes in climate. Thank you, that's a great question. So Clean Water Services, what we're, our focus is the provision of um, sewage uh, treatment as well as um, storm water. But certainly, it's all water, whether it's drinking water, storm water, or wastewater in itself. So Clean Water Services has a long history of collaborating with its water partners uh, for the potable supply sources and the planning um, that's going on. The Hag Lake project is extremely important to Clean Water Services. If you can imagine as this county grows, and imagine as we bring another 80 million gallons of drinking water from the Landed source. That water has to go somewhere. That water needs to be treated. And that water ultimately will go back to the Tualatin River. And as part of wastewater treatment, we need to have the adequate uh, river flows to be able to support um, that water uh, returning to the river. So the Hag Lake project is certainly extremely important um, to the district. And in terms of planning for the long term uh, water supply needs, um, we feel it's a very important role for us to collaborate. Um, with our partners. Climate change is an interesting issue. Um, we'll see um, as time goes on how it begins affecting us um, here in the region. There's some projections and the error bar is very wide as to what's really going to happen. When you're looking at all of the, the data and the research, it's pretty clear that things will be more chaotic. Um, the extremes of very wet years versus extremes of very dry years, we're, we're going to see that. The district is planning through its um, stormwater uh, planning as well as the uh, wastewater planning um, as we move forward. But it's pretty clear we need more resilient systems, and our streams and our creeks and our river is going to be um, challenged at both ends of those extremes. So together, we do need to plan. Chris Leslie, board member, a number of questions. Uh, one, uh, the asteroid belts are mostly contain water and the earth is bombarded with water every day and how with the new space projects uh, and space service we can have water for the rest of our lives no matter what and you're uh, playing the scare card we're running out of water we're not running out of water ever and this is an anti-science viewpoint, and I think uh, you should be called to task for that. And that's interesting about um, the water cycle. I think it's not so much a scare tactic, but it's really looking
looking at the reality as to where our water is and how it moves through the hydrologic cycle and how we understand um, our sources of fresh water and what our access to water is. But I certainly think we need to plan not only for our current generation, but our for future generations to come. And as we envision Washington County growing, as we envision the state of Oregon growing, uh, where are we going to get our sources of water? So it's not so much a scare tactic, but it, it's really the reality of where are our freshwater sources. So it's groundwater or it's surface water. But there's also the potential to reuse our water that comes from our treatment facilities themselves. We can reuse it for irrigation, like we currently do, to irrigate um, some golf courses and landscaping. But there's certainly other ways to reuse the water. And I think um, we'll see what this next generation will bring and the planning that we'll do together. Aren't there any environmental groups against the building in the wetlands? Um, for this particular project, um, there aren't any environmental groups that are concerned about this particular project. Um, we're making sure that we're talking to all of the groups, um, whether it's the Tuolumne River Keepers or it's the Audubon Society, all of the folks that have an interest in this site. I think there is a broader issue related to wetlands themselves, and it's an issue that is not only um, statewide, but it's an issue certainly nationally about how we view the function of these wetlands as we um, develop the land. And certainly in Washington County, um, we have a system of linked wetlands and also wetlands that aren't linked together. But certainly the function as a whole as we move forward, as we develop our land, we, is, is certainly uh, something that we're working on. This would be a yes or no. Don't you believe that we have the resources and space to supply our water for the rest of Earth's life? You know, I hadn't thought of that angle, so that's a very interesting one that you bring up. So it's something um, I'll certainly take a look at. I hadn't thought through that, but thank you. I'm surprised you aren't gifted with a degree in astrophysics. <laughs> but, um, I suppose we should expect the broad range of questions. <laughs> I've been asking broad one too, so Chris, don't feel too bad. John Tyner, forum member. Um, the, the current configuration of the Tualatin Valley River. The Tualatin River is, is based upon a compromise that was made some years ago in the 50s between the three jurisdictions, Multnomah County, Washington County, and, and uh, Clackamas County, which resulted in Sucker Lake becoming Lake Oswego, and um, essentially the, the Tualatin River being an agricultural um, watering zone. Are you familiar with that um, decision and how it came about? No. Then I'll go to my next question. <laughs> We're going to talk about Kniper Belt and Astro Asteroid Belt. We can talk about historical decisions back regarding water supply. Um, the interaction of the various water supplies. Um, we have the um, Jackson Boat Slough, and, which is like run by Hillsborough, is that correct? Or? The Jackson Bottom Wetlands? Yeah, that's that, mm -hmm. that it's, it's a partnership with Clean Water Services. And, City you've Hills got, and you've got the Durham a site down there by Tiger High School. You've got the Fernhill Wetlands, and you have the Metro plan to try to have water um, ways connected and wildlife ways connected. I'm going to step back to a little global thing. How do? What is the interaction of all those things in Clackamas County, Washington County, Oklahoma County? Sort of an overview in say five to fifteen minutes. That's a big question. <laughs> and that's, I think, one of the uh, thorny questions of the future is how we allocate water in all of these basins. So certainly our drinking water supplies come from the Tualatin River themselves, as well as uh, water that comes from uh, Portland, and now water that's going to be developed by the city of Tiger in partnership with others, and plus the uh, water source that's coming from the Willamette River. So it's pretty clear that water is something that we need here in Washington County to flourish. It's something our businesses and our citizens certainly value. Um, Washington County's growth is based upon the availability of clean water. And the flip side of clean water uh, for potable supply is the question of wastewater. So as we import and bring these water sources into the Long River, um, watershed, we're certainly rich with water at that point. And the question becomes, what do we want to do in the long run uh, with that water and the planning for the water? 
but um, certainly there's been long-term water supply uh, collaboration that's been done. I think this county is secure in its water sources and its planning. Um, I think we're going to have a bit of a challenge to know what to do with all of that water uh, once we, we do utilize it all. But I think it also opens up opportunities. Um, opportunities to be able to uplift our um, local stream corridors to get them to ecologically uh, function uh, better. It, it links to our um, stream side um, planting where we're trying to shade and create um, more robust riparian zones um, so that we can have a, the, a better um, ability to deal with the issues coming to us in the future. Oh, Diane, uh, thank you so much for being here and presenting uh, this really interesting uh, information about Washington County. Uh, John McWilliams, a forum member, um, we talked a little bit, I heard a little bit about um, the Tualatin River and uh, things that happened to that river. Uh, can you talk a little bit about maybe about how Clean Water Services has a to do with the help out the fish there? Maybe there's no fish in, in the Fernhill Lake, but uh, there is, certainly is in the fish in the Tualatin River, and uh, I understand that there are certain times that you have to add some more water or something like that. Are you familiar with that? Could sure. You, could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, the, the function of Hag Lake is extremely important to the Tualatin River. It allows us to add a minimum stream flows and to maintain water in the river itself. There's some wonderful historical pictures where I think it was um, uh, one of the local farmers and citizens where they were able to literally stand and straddle the river itself. The river ran between his legs. We simply didn't have enough water um, in the Tualatin River because we were overusing it. We were using it for human needs, but yet there wasn't enough water uh, for the, the river itself. The river has particularly some, some pretty big challenges because we're pretty much rain-fed. We don't have a snowpack that we can rely upon. So the reservoirs of Arnie Reservoir and Hag Lake allows us to, um, through the rainy season, store water, and then through the drier seasons to be able to release water into the river so we can for agricultural uses as well as for um, human potable needs. So the issues with the river itself, the river when you look at it, it's much better than it was from back in the 70s uh, with the, the uh, upgrades that we did to the sewage treatment plants, but also much better because of the water that um, Clean Water Services releases to the river itself. Um, in the future, as we bring in more water um, to our region and we need to treat that water, we need more stream flow to be able to, um, to deal with that water. So certainly the dam raise is a very important project um, to clean water services. So as we are in the county, we need to look at water holistically, not only what's needed for uh, potable supply, but what's, what's needed for agriculture, um, what's needed for uh, the environment, and also for uh, wastewater. But certainly continuing to partner, as we have done here in Washington County, is critical in the future. So I understand, though, that, uh, that uh, from the treatment plants, they put water back into the river. Um, there's a little bit of a problem, and the water is cleaner than the river, the river water. And so uh, that could be a problem for the fish. Uh, can you talk about that at all? Yeah, the, the issues with the fish are very complex. Um, there's somewhat issues related to temperature, so the thermal temperature of the river itself. There's other concerns about particular water chemistry that, that folks are interested in, but it's really a balance of all of those things. And what Fernhill is going to do is create a water that has been in contact with the plants and with the soil, and it will create a more robust food web. And that's really what the fish need. They need the macrovertebrates, they need the algae, they need all of the other food sources to be able to flourish. So it's not only just about the water chemistry or about the thermal things that are needed, but at Fern Hill, we're moving into the future of looking at what it, is, what it is that those fisheries need also from a food web standpoint. So that's why Clean Water Services invests not only in wastewater treatment, so that's the water chemistry part of it, but we also invest in uplifting the, uh, the river and its tributary streams themselves with shade, and also um, by controlling the pollution that comes from stormwater. 
itself. So it's really all of those things put together. But ultimately, you need to have a robust biological system in the river itself. And that's what Fern Hill is starting to do. John, let's look for a member. Um, as you mentioned, uh, water is water. And I'm wondering whether, um, whether there are advantages to um, having a single agency manage all water resources. I mean, here in Washington County, we have uh, we actually have several agencies that, that are responsible for, for drinkable water. Um, uh, and Clean Water Services deals with stormwater and wastewater. But are there are there advantages to, to unifying that function so that rather than having to coordinate with other agencies, um, you actually that's a really interesting question. Um, I think for a region itself, it's a, it's a complex question because we're not only a county, but we're also made up of cities. And the cities themselves are providers of service, both for potable supply, and also their own collection systems. We work through partnerships. My personal belief is working through collaborative partnerships is, a very, is what makes Washington County strong. Um, you could certainly have a model of a single unified agency, but certainly the model that we have today also works and there's a lot of strength in it. Um, we view things from different lenses and from different perspectives. It's important to have agricultural um, interests as well as um, the needs for the urban areas. And I think because of the way we are structured in Washington County, and I think the collaborations that we have um, work very well. I mean, but you can certainly have either model. John Leaper, forum member. Thank you very much for a very informative presentation. You brought up different aspects of water as a general subject that I don't think have been addressed to us before. I, for several years, have been of the opinion that clean water services is almost a two-headed monster. Two-headed in that you take care of cleaning up the water, as well as stormwater management. That's one function I think. The other is, I think uh, you are almost a frustrated uh, construction management outfit, because in addition to continuously expanding your capacity, you also got a continuing need to accommodate new requirements from both federal and state agencies. And I was wondering if you either could or would address what your capital improvement budget is, both for this year as well as in the past. It is, I think, well up into the seven figures, but that's just speculation on my part. Sure, the capital budget runs on average about $60 million a year. And the purpose of this is that there are some communities, so if you're a, a city, um, unlike other cities in the valley, you would often uh, borrow the money and you would do a very large expansion. But from a business perspective, you're laying a lot of assets down that are going to remain idle for quite a long time. So if you build a treatments facility that's going to last 20 years, most of your assets are lying idle. That's one issue. The second issue is that technology in wastewater treatment is rapidly changing whether it's equipment itself or the types of um, uh, biological systems that are used. So the, the technology that we used to use in the 70s and 80s is really outdated for the year 2013 and beyond. So not only would you have invested in assets that are idle, you would have invested in technology that is old. So Clean Water Services has adopted a, stra adopted a strategy in which we make investments in a time so we have adequate capacity. So if we get a big industry or some big growth occurs, we do maintain some um, capacity to be able to accommodate those over time. But really, we're building increments of capacity so that we can take advantage of the current or modern technology, as well as building um, facilities when they're needed in time. So in terms of clean water services and the number of uh, people that we're serving here in the county, it makes a lot more sense to be able to build these. We call it just in time, but in reality, it's it's time to meet 
permit requirements, it's time to the capacity growth that's going on um, within the county. And from a money perspective, and many of you are business people, I mean, you wouldn't want to invest in a manufacturing facility that had way too much capacity that was idle for most of the time. So I think from a business perspective, take advantage of the current uh, construction climate that we have that has brought us very good bids, plus um, build technology that is current and relevant, not only for now, but us also in the future, and build the capacity that you need with a little bit more so that you can um, be able to effectively address the needs for the county. But um, in terms of the uh, value that it creates for all of you is that it's wiser um, investments in a timely manner, and we're not idling any capacity and um, taking advantage of technology. So that's the value that's created. Eric Squires, former member. Diane, first, great job. Really enjoyable presentation. Thank you. Uh, my question is as follows. I was recently reading Oregon Fishing uh, Guidelines, and I was horrified to see the restrictions, including daily intake or monthly intake on certain salmon or other fish from certain areas because of pollutants. I'm wondering if you could tell me how Clean Water Services addresses pollutants, uh, uh, specifically like heavy metals or PCBs, any of the toxic petrochemicals, uh, and how that impacts a Clean Water Services work protocol. Sure, and that's a great question. Um, the issue of pollution is very interesting because over time uh, it has changed and it has evolved with our ability through science to measure and detect things to, to very low levels. And with pollution control, it first started with the organics, so the carbon, you know, the, the carbon and um, the ability to remove suspended solids because those were the things that were choking the rivers in terms of using all the oxygen in the rivers. And I think some of you might remember when uh, Tom McCall did his call to action for the Willamette River. There were, I've seen photographs of fish that were literally leaping out of the water for the lack of dissolved oxygen. So we dealt with those issues first, right? Those were the, the big advancements. Um, now the issues are more diffuse, and it's diffuse pollution. It's pollution from things that we never really thought of. It's things like the caffeine that we drink that we, um, then when we're done with the caffeine, uh, go to the bathroom. The, the things like endocrine disruptors, the things like all of the personal care products that we use, clean water services. We have a very advanced monitoring system that we partner with USGS to look at these, I call them the wicked problems of the world, because certainly as we understand the products that we use and the limitations to our willingness to pay for, for some of this technology that it will take in the future to deal with these things. Um, it's certainly um, policy and issues that we're going to face, but certainly we track the issues that are going on globally um, in the European nations, and there is a whole area of science in terms of natural treatment systems that has a lot of benefit to removing not only heavy metals through um, existing treatment plants, through the chemicals, and the energy that we add, but also looking at this diffuse pollution as really there is no removal. It's really how do we transform these constituents and cycle them through the environment that's appropriate uh, for us as humans and for the aquatic environment. There is a lot of concern about fish consumption and um, the things that are bioaccumulating in fish and together. Um, I think this is a global issue as well as um, a national state issue to think about um, these pollutants and really it's not the notion of removal but it's going to become a notion of do we need to use these things in the very first place but these are going to be the thorny issues not only for this generation but I think generations to come. Uh, Lee Coleman, forum, a forum member. I was struck by your statement that uh, a lot of these facilities remain idle for a long time time until they come into full usefulness. And that raises the question for me of, of uh, what kind of amortization period you're using in order to charge ratepayers or property taxpayers. Uh, it would seem to me that if you're going to amortize a, an idle project, you want a rather lengthy 
amortization period. And I don't see that. So what is the policy on that? Sure, that'd be a great discussion that we could have at a, at a future forum. Um, the issue of rates and how do we pay for these facilities is a very important one. And the capital projects themselves are supported by systems development charges as well as by rates. So the portions of the treatment facility that all of the existing um, citizens utilize that need to have technology upgrades, that's something that we would pay through rates, usually through bond issuances. The portion that is for future growth is how we pay for it through systems development charges. Basically, our bonds are 20-year bonds, so we're building um, enough rates and systems development charges to be able to pay for these facilities in a 20-year period. But some of the structures themselves um, do have a, probably a longer life, a 50-year life, but we're building the structures so they're flexible, that they can be retrofitted with um, the newer pumps and the newer technology, those could have a life of anywhere from 10 to uh, 20 years. So it really depends on the asset itself. But the underlying principle is with these large capital investments, we, we utilize debt financing to be able to do them, as well as pay as you go. I don't know you, John Tech, long member, in the memory of my life, and that people have told me the stories, Rover's Rest and Tiger was actually a resort where people boated. And uh, in the last century, um, steamboats actually went to Forest Grove as part of the process up and down the river. And as I understand, we're talking to the folks um, deceased now, but old when I was young, the river was much more vital and became a, um, an agricultural um, essential canal sometime in the 60s and 70s. Um, are you aware of any of those things that I was talking about or the, the history of the river as a much more vital artery of commerce and recreation than it is now? I know a little bit of the history of the Tualatin River. The, the history that I really recollect is the time when the water was over-allocated and over-appropriated and, and the time when there really was no water um, in the river itself. I think that trend has reversed itself. There, there are certainly um, better stream flows in that river. There is a future. Um, folks are talking about a water trail on the Tualatin uh, River with canoes. I don't know whether there will be steamboats and, and those types of things in our future, but it, it's certainly something um, that are, I think, dreams of what um, folks in the county would like to do with the river itself. But um, certainly the river today is in much better health than it was yesteryears and, and that's really because of all of you in this room and all of the citizens here in Washington County making the investments together with agriculture and with industry. Again, great presentation from all. For, thank you for coming here. I read uh, something like $20 per individual property holder would be the expense of the new improvements. Do you have any budgetary figures that you can give us? Um, I'm not sure about that. Expenses. You know, I think there may be... Um, A tax. Yeah, see, when we talk about water, there's the, uh, the water that's related to bringing the water source from the Willamette. That's one cost of water. Um, the cost of water for... Um, for clean water services deals with stormwater and wastewater. Um, so I'm not sure where that number it's you had. Involved with the wetlands. Okay, so the treatment wetlands themselves, we're looking at spending up to about $18 million um, with the, the treatment capacity that's going to be created out there. Um, and it's, it's money that will be spent between now and 2017. Um, when you look at the relative um, treatment costs of a natural treatment system versus a high rate biological, physical, chemical treatment plant, it's much cheaper to do it utilizing the natural treatment system than it is to build more concrete tanks. We call it more concrete and steel and pumps and aeration and chemicals and energy. So when you look at the overall costs of the natural treatment system, bringing um, the assets of Forest Grove and Hillsboro to be used year 
ground and um, avoiding uh, treatment expansion at Rock Creek in this time period. We're probably saving about one and a half to one. I saw some pictures of the project uh, projected that you had buildings that seemed to have no real purpose except for maybe offloading children. Oh, I see. Yeah, so on one of the drawings, there is, um, there's been a dream, a vision for a learning center that the Fernhill Council has had, and they want the site to be a site of science. They want the site to be able to bring people in who are experts in wetlands and wetland treatment sciences to be able to convene and to um, look at this technology. Um, there is a portion of the upper treatment wetlands, even though when you envision wetlands, you're thinking of a, a hole in the ground with plants. These treatment wetlands are going to be of a higher technology. So they're going to be a combined subsurface and a surface treatment wetland that has um, control to it. So we're going to be utilizing nature, but we're also going to be um, controlling the amount of flow that we put to it. These are called reciprocating or tidal um, subsurface wetlands that um, enhances the removal of nitrogen. So we're going to use nitrification and denitrification as well as phosphorus removal and metals removal. There's a particular type of media that we're going to um, select for these different um, treatment technologies. So that being said, even though they're natural treatment systems, there'll be a control component to it. So there will be a control room that's needed to be able to run the, the technology related to those wetlands. But the lower wetlands um, that Spring Hill Lake, Eagle Perch Marsh, and Cattail Marsh, those will be the traditional um, natural treatment systems that just use solar energy and wind. Do we get the gold that's extracted from the water? Now that's an, always an interesting thing about resource recovery and uh, clean water services is investing in resource recovery. We're uh, investing in right now phosphorus uh, recovery. So we've created a product called Clean Water Grow that um, you can uh, get at various locations. I think Farmington Gardens is a place and then East Hardware also. But um, the question about metals and can be concentrated enough to be able to remove and recover them would be a, a very good, interesting one. Not likely, though. I don't think there's enough. The place you would want to recover it is at the uh, source of it itself. John, John Weeper, I'll take another line. Yeah. I have taken tours of both Rock Creek as well as your other big facility. I think. The members of the community here, as well as in the listening audience, will be bowled over if they had any real appreciation of the size of the pipes that there are at those facilities. Could you just run some numbers as to the size of a few of the both tanks as well as the pipes that are at those big facilities? Because, gee whiz, it's just almost overwhelming. Yeah, I could probably stand in those pipes. So yeah, they're very large um, diameter pipelines. You that, stand on my shoulders. Yeah, I could probably stand on your shoulders. But the um, the tanks themselves are as big as this room. But yes, the structures are massive. In order to remove that first 98 to 99 percent of the pollutants, um, filled with um, equipment and aeration equipment and pumps and blowers and. Um, but I encourage anybody.